Howdy, I'm Jay Woodmer, Interventional Cardiology Fellow here at Mayo Clinic Rochester. During today's recording, we'll be discussing PCI versus cabbage in the post-syntax era. I'm joined by two mentors, Dr. David Holmes, Interventional Cardiology Pioneer, and Dr. Lyle Joyce, Cardiovascular Surgery here at Mayo. Welcome to you both. We'll go ahead and get started. And we'll start with you, Dr. Joyce. Uh, based on uh, two of the recent trials and the syntax trial, how can there be such striking differences in terms of the results and the reportings in such well-designed trials? I think we need to look at uh, several different uh, facts in considering what uh, went into the design of the trials and also the timing of the trials. The, uh, the Syntec trial, for example, I think completed its enrollment in 2007, mm -hmm. whereas the Excel and Noble uh, trials are much more recent than that. In that period of time, there's been a marked improvement in PCI and stent technology. So I think to compare something that's 10 years earlier with the technology that we have now is likely going to give some varying results. There's also some differences in the uh, definitions, for example, um, the, what constitutes an MI. Also a little difference in what groups of patients were studied as far as the XL trial looking more at the left main with low risk syntax, syntax mm -hmm. scores as opposed to the others. Exactly. And going with that left main subpopulation, Dr. Holmes, who do you think is a candidate now for left main coronary PCI based on the results of these trials? I think that's a really important uh, question. Depends upon what the specific uh, metrics are that you're going to use to, to talk with the patient about. I think those patients that are um, probably optimally suited for dilatation of left main disease would those still be those with osteo lesion and trunk lesion. Bifurcation disease, distal bifurcation, left main disease is clearly treatable, although it's much more complex, as you know, and I think the results are not as good as with more isolated left main disease. I think isolated left main disease in the absence of other um, complicating factors of complexity of coronary disease is very well treated with PCI as well as with uh, surgery. Um, the, there is a difference between the two. Uh, one of the endpoints that is important is that all of the data on surgery except for the Nobel trial would indicate that stroke is, incre is increased with surgery as compared to dilatation. Now, the difference is statistically significant, but it is small. There isn't mm -hmm. any question about that. The next piece of information is to say as the lesions get more complex, as the complexity of disease increases further, the syntax trial identified the fact that more extensive disease is better treated with coronary bypass graft surgery. I don't think these trials have really changed that or moved the needle. I think those patients that have extensive multivessel disease that cannot be treated with intervention, those patients that have LV dysfunction, those patients are still better served by coronary surgery in terms of the overall composite endpoint. Exactly, exactly. Well, th Dr. Joyce, heading back to you in terms of the newer trials, for you, did you have any changes in your practice based on Noble and Excel versus what we saw in Syntax? No, I think our, our practice has continued pretty much the same. Uh, you know, the fact is, if you, if you really sort out the details of the XL trial, for example, it was looking more at the patients with a low Syntex score. And if you look at the results of the Syntex trial in the low uh, Syntex score group, they're not that much different than right. the XL trial. Right. So, so there's an interesting, um, hey, to interrupt, there's an interesting issue we have really relied on the concept that arterial revascularization would be better than anything. Um, and so we then said, gosh, if there is one artery, it's really good, uh, it's the lima. If you were to add a second artery, the rima, that the results would be much better than a lima plus vein grafts. And so it was surprising to see the literature of the recent trial that found that there isn't any difference between um, one mammary and two mammaries, which was surprising, because we always said, gosh, the reason that syntax surgeons didn't do as well, as you might have thought they could have done better, was that most of the time they just used a single mammary. 
The same was true in Noble and Excel. We might then say, gosh, or we did say, if you had used two memories, they would do much better. And yet the trial showed that there isn't any difference right. if you use one or versus two. Can you, can you talk about that? Well, I think we have to go back to some of the original studies at looking at what keeps vessels open. And there's no question but what a graft to the left anterior descending coronary artery right. has a higher patent, long-term patency rate than any of the other tar the circumflex or the right coronaries. So I think to expect a rema to the right or to the circumflex to be equal to the left internal memory down to the LAD probably isn't justified. I mean, it's, part of it is just the runoff and the makeup of the vessel and the, and the disease of the vessel. So um, we certainly believe that all arterial grafting is the way to go. But uh, it does. We just can't prove it. <laughs> well, <laughs> but other do you, than that, <laughs> do you think that do you think that we're we're not quite at the at the end point for that? We were looking at five year results for the recent trial that you 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 noted. Are we, at ten years? Do you think we'll see any difference? Well, certainly, it's been shown that the left internal memory to the LED has a striking difference in fifteen plus year patency rates. So, I think you're right. If we get out past the perioperative period the first year and look down the road 10 and 15 years, we probably will see an improvement in, in uh, bilateral memories and perhaps all arterial. The radial is, is you know, a little less uh, dependable than the right internal memory artery. One of the problems, as you've talked about, is as we get to 10 and 15 years, by the time we look at 10 and 15 years, all the technology has changed because it's 10 or 15 years well, and that was seen in syntax. In syntax, for example, we used a drug eluding stent that is not even manufactured anymore. It's not nearly as good as what we currently have, but we didn't have that better stent when the syntax trial was, was started. And so looking at long-term data is always complicated by that. Definitely. Surgical techniques get better and interventional techniques get better. And so does that mean that what we should do is to focus on concepts of complete revascularization or concepts of using an arterial graft irrespective of what uh, whether it's single or dual mammaries or radials versus using um, percutaneous techniques that just treat a small segment of the artery. There are lots of different things to talk about in that regard. There are. In fact, uh, going back to the Syntex trial, that was one of the problems with, uh, with PCI was the, the um, inability to completely revascularize. And actually, there was that subgroup that uh, looked at the residual Syntex right. score. And if the residual Syntex score was, I think, over eight, Right. then the prognosis was worse. So, um, yes, I think, I think those elements are important. But you're absolutely right. It's very difficult to compare 10-year data from a stent right. that's not even around anymore. Uh, it's perhaps a little bit more reliable in the surgical technology because the one, only variable there at the present time that we have made really has been uh, two things. One is whether we use all arterial or not, and then whether it's on or off pump. Those, otherwise, our techniques are pretty much similar to what they've been 10, 15 years ago. So I'd like to talk about the, some of the technologies in a little bit, but going back to the residual syntax score, we saw even with Excel, <clears throat> the on-site calculated or, or uh, estimated syntax score was much lower than the core lab. It's a difficult thing to, to come up with and sometimes are doing these things on the fly. Do you think that the syntax score is something that we can integrate into our practice? I'll throw it to either one. Integrate into our practice easily. What are some ways we can use that? Or should we be looking somewhere else? Um, I could take that. Um, it is terribly important that the practice of interventional cardiology has changed and continues to change. It used to be the concept of dilatation sort of at the time of diagnostic angiography was something that, well, first of all, it's very popular with patients, <laughs> but second of all, the professional societies have backed away from that, mm -hmm. and I think that that is important in that regard. In fact, Europe has led the way in that. If you have a patient that has elective symptoms, that you're considering elective revascularization, so the patient that has relatively stable angina, if they have multivessel disease, 
by mandate, they're taken off the table, and then the heart team is brought together to review things. In that system, then you can calculate its index score. Mm -hmm. It's not like you have to do it on the fly. You have a chance to do that. Now, having said that, there is some pushback from patients. Mm -hmm. They'd rather not come back to the laboratory. They'd rather not have two procedures. However, having said that, it's such an important decision that I think that the heart team to truly, in all of its manifestations, um, evoke that and bring that to play is a terribly important point. I don't know, Ryan, you no, I agree. I think the, you know, it is complex and, and it's difficult for the patient to understand, but I think the most important thing for the patient to know is that there is a, a, a heart team that's looking at it which comprises members on both sides of the table, surgical as well as cardiology, and I would, I think that's the assurance that the patient needs that when both groups have looked at it and decided on the basis of syntax or other elements that are involved to, um, that, that you know the recommendation is a, is a combined um, recommendation. The surgeon, for example, is going to look more at things like uh, you know what's the how much problem does the patient have with COPD or renal failure, you know the the other comorbid problems. The cardiologist is probably going to look more at uh, the anatomy, how much calcification is, the chronicity of occlusion, those sort of things that make a, a technical difference. Okay. And it's p important that the patient knows that uh, all those things have been factored into in the decision. recommendation that is provided him. So what we, we talk about <clears throat> in patient-centric care. So we have a heart team, and then we have the patient as part of that. As we talk with patients, it's very hard for them to keep in mind the issue that there is a difference in the, maybe a hierarchical endpoint of stroke versus repeat revascularization versus death versus myocardial like, infarction. There are some patients when you talk to them and say, Josh, the, the survival at five years is the same. And, and that is true in most of the, mm -hmm. most of the trials. But there is a difference in repeat revascularization and a difference in myocardial infarction and a difference in stroke. The patient then typically says, well, tell me about this stroke thing, because that's the thing that I fear the, the most. And so then while you can present stuff to the patient, the patient's attitude winds up really coloring mm -hmm. many different things. How do, you, how do you approach that? When I discuss it with the patient, I, I try to get them to focus on two differences. One is the long-term benefit versus the short-term benefit. And I try to explain to them that yes, when you're talking about stroke and, and MI and those sort of things, you're sort of taking more of the risk up front with going the surgical route. Whereas if you're looking at the long-term outcome, uh, then maybe you have to weigh in a little bit more. Okay, is it more important for me to sort of get over this hump and then know that I'm not going to have to worry about anything for a longer period of time? Or is it more important to me to just have the least invasive approach taken right now and I'll worry about that later? And it's interesting, patients are different, aren't they? I mean, one patient is adamant that there's no way I'm ever coming back. You better do, you know, do whatever you're going to do that's going to fix me for the rest of my life. And the next one's going to say, boy, if I don't have to go to surgery, just fix me up as simply as you can. We'll worry about that later. That last patient, and having been in that circumstance, um, to take the short-term option because then they immediately say, well, in five years I will have been exercising like crazy. I'm for sure I will have stopped smoking. I'm, my blood pressure is going to be perfect. So there's lots of things I can do that will impact that thing. I haven't said that. Most of the time that doesn't happen that because in true. five years we're still about as heavy as we are now. <laughs> but you bring up a good point about, about optimal medical therapy, smoking, cessation, exercise, that sort of thing. And, and you were uh, author on a paper with uh, Iqbal and colleagues about optimal med medical therapy in the Syntax trial. Curious if you have thoughts if optimal medical therapy in some of these newer trials will have an impact or could have an impact on some of the outcome, and how can we use that to weigh into some of our, our patient-centered decisions? Sure. I think that the concept of optimal medical therapy is incredibly easy to say. I think the implementation of that is incredibly difficult because it involves um, multiple different things. It involves the economics of taking pills for a long time. It involves the issue of willpower, 
which, as we know, lasts for 30 days and is soluble in alcohol, um, and a whole bunch of other things in terms of side effects for drugs. And so when we put patients on an optimal medical therapy that includes losing weight and exercise and stopping smoking um, and taking medications every day, boy, at five years, the number of patients that are able to do that is really limited. Mm -hmm. It would be just like saying the Ornish diet is a great diet. You have to just eat um, dandelions. Or, or, <laughs> I'm, not, I'm not sure exactly what that means. But, um, and the, the number of people that can do that do incredibly well. It's just that that's a small Very number tough. of people. And so optimal medical therapy is a great goal terribly important, but boy, we, we don't have very good strategies for that. Absolutely. I don't know, maybe you have better strategies in, well, in surgical no, I mean, sure. yeah, <laughs> Unfortunately, uh, you know, I'm disappointed in our surgical colleagues in the Syntex trial. I mean, the, the failure to continue with optimal medical treatment was uh, far too low in that, that surgical arm. We know it's beneficial. There's no question about it. If they're on a, a, at least a single platelet uh, inhibitor and uh, a statin and a beta blocker and an ACE inhibitor, uh, but uh, it, uh, you're right. It, it just isn't followed as as completely as it needs to be. Even what? knowing that the outcomes are so much, much better. better. One of the problems is that patients come in with a heart problem and they think you're going to save their life, and then you revascularize them with. A surgery or dilatation, and at that point in time, we, it's very hard to get the message across saying, um, we have not eliminated the need for medications. Right. Right. Yeah. And it's not going to last forever. That's right. Yeah. So looking down the road, five, ten years, uh, in terms of stent technology, surgical technologies, what do you all see as things that might uh, turn the corner for some of these or be game changers in terms of things we will do in five to ten years, Dr. Holmes? So I think you could include on that then some of the new medications uh, that are coming along, the PCSK9 drugs, um, in which compliance may not be as big a problem because it could be once a month mm -hmm. or once every two weeks or it could be a vaccine, mm -hmm. if indeed that works. Right. That will be a huge game changer. Now, nobody knows whether that's going to work or not, but that's the sort of thing that could, number one, improve compliance if you can afford it. If cost um, is going to be huge too. And then um, may be incredibly effective in reaching target levels of things, whatever those are. In terms of the technical approach to um, revascularization, I think we are continuing, uh, from a Perkins standpoint, we're making iterative changes. The bioabsorbable revascular uh, vascular scaffolds are being tested. Whether they will truly make a huge difference is not clear. We're continuing to make the stents uh, thinner with thinner struts and better in terms of being able to resist the compressive forces. Mm -hmm. um, but I think those are iterative changes. I don't yeah. think that uh, that as yet we see a home run. Okay. Maybe, I don't know, maybe it's different well, I, with surgery. No, I agree. I think a lot of the advancements are going to be in the in the medical uh, realm. From a surgical standpoint, uh, particularly if there continues to be equipoise between the, the two technologies, I think maybe we will swing more towards some more hybrid approaches. You know, probably the best treatment for any patient is an internal mammary down to the LED. And then maybe some of those other lesions will be particularly if the technology improves even as well as it is and even more, mm -hmm. those other le lesions will be better treated uh, in the cath lab. And uh, then we can offer a truly minimally invasive approach surgically to get the important lesion taken care of in the LED and then finish it up in the cath lab. Tell us about the future then of a mammary artery that could be on the shelf using sort of biotech <laughs> genetic engineering stuff that you could then, um, in the operating room, have the technical people bring you three mammary arteries and put them to every place and do it sort of with minimally invasive. Is that, is that, gonna, is that reality? Is that coming? Is it feasible, do you think, or look forward? Because that would be a, that a would, true game changer. Right. Um, I think the best way to say that is I think that is the future. My concern is, is it always going to be the future? I, we just, I mean, we've tried so many ways to, to engineer artificial uh, uh, vessels, 
and none of them have panned out as yet. But I think that is the direction that we need to go from a surgical standpoint. If we could do that, it would be so much better for the patient. Great. Great. Well, Dr. Holmes, Dr. Joyce, thank you both so much for agreeing to do this. And thank you all uh, for joining us here on the heart.org on Medscape for these very important insights.